previous lecture on static electric fields. And in this lecture, we look at material media in static electric field. The electric field we looked at uh, in the last lecture was relative to um, free space. If you remember, we indicated that the permittivity of the space under consideration is uh, epsilon naught, 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 product per meter, which is the permittivity of free space. So we only look at phenomenon in free space. What is the situation when you have a material media in static electric field? That is the focus for today's lecture. Now, as we know, material medias or material media or materials in general are classified according to the electrical properties. And the classifications are conductors. What is a conductor? Conductors usually have their outermost electrons delocalized, which is the case of most metals. What does this mean? You know that um, the structure of an atom, according to the Rutherford model, is that you have you have a nucleus, right? You have a nucleus, and surrounding the nucleus, surrounding the nucleus are what? Electrons. So depending on the structure of the atom, you may have two electrons in the inner shell and some more electrons in the outermost shell, right? and so on and so forth. But in the case of conductors, conductors usually have their outermost shell delocalized, which means that if the outermost shell has only one electron or two, electro or two electrons or three electrons, these electrons are set free from their mother atom. So you have the nucleus, Around the nucleus, you have the orbit. And this electron, which is in the nucleus, uh, for the first uh, orbit may be there. But then the ones in the outermost shell, if it is one, it is usually set free from its mother atoms. So in the case of sodium, for example, you see that sodium will be sodium plus because it has one electron in the outermost shell and that electron is delocalized, de is set free. In the case of copper, copper will be copper two plus, which means that there are two electrons in the outermost shell, and that electrons or those two electrons, they are what? Delocalized. If it is aluminum, aluminum will be what? Three plus, because there are three electrons in the outermost shell, and those three electrons are also what? delocalized, and so on and so forth. Now, because those electrons are delocalized, you have, if this is the material, which is copper, you have the positive centers. Why do you have positive centers? Because the electrons in the outermost shells are delocalized, and because they are delocalized, then the atom becomes positive. So you have positive centers. And then, please, uh, watch your mic, watch your mic. And then the electrons, and the electrons which have been delocalized, they are free to move within the atom, like that. So basically, you have the positive centers within a sea of electrons. And these electrons are free to move. And therefore, when you apply a potential to the material, like you connect it to a battery or something like that, then the electrons are able to freely move and then they conduct electric current. And that is why conductors 
are able to conduct easily because their electrons are delocalized. So conductors have their outermost electrons delocalized, which is the case of what? Most metals. What about semiconductors? As for semiconductors, they possess a relatively small number of free movable charge. Okay, and these charges are usually not free to move until again they gain some energy. And therefore they cannot conduct as much as um, as much as uh, uh, conductors do conduct, okay? And then the last category is insulators. As for insulators, their electrons in the atoms are confined to their orbit. In other words, they are not free to move at all. So insulators mostly are not able to conduct electricity. So these are the basic three categories of um, materials. As far as the conduction is concerned, we have conductors, we have semiconductors, and then we have insulators. So the parameter that characterizes the ability of a material to conduct is called the conductivity. Is the conductivity of the material. So depending on the value of the conductivity of the material, the material can either conduct or it cannot conduct. So let's look at conductors in static electric field. And here I need your maximum attention. What would happen if you put a conductor uh, in an electric field? So that to create the electric field, let's assume that some positive or negative charges are introduced in the interior of a good conductor. That means what? Inside the conductor. I hope you understand that. When you introduce the positive or negative charges inside the conductor, then inside the conductor, an electric field will be created. You remember in our last uh, discussion, we said if you have a positive charge like this, it will set up an electric field around it. But this was the case of what? A charge in free space, right? But this time, we're not talking about a charge in free space. We're talking about the case of a charge inside a conductor. So when you have the charge inside the conductor, it will set up an electric field inside the conductor. Now, once you have an electric field, as you remember, when we had the positive charge, which sets up its field like that, Now, if you bring another electron within the field of this uh, positive charge, this electron will experience the force of the field, right? And that force F is given by QE, if you remember. So similarly, when we have a charge introduced in the interior of a conductor, that charge will set up an electric field. Now the electrons in the material or in the conductor will now experience the force created by the field of this charge which has been introduced inside the conductor. So the field will exert a force on the charges of the material and the material here is a conductor. Now as the electrons in the conductor experience a force due to the field created by the charge which has been introduced inside the conductor, these electrons will begin to move. They will begin to drift away from one another because a force is being exerted on each one of them. Where is that force coming from? It's coming from the field that was created by the charge which was introduced inside the conductor. So they begin to drift apart. 
So what you would have is that negative charges inside the conductor will be on one side and positive charges will be on the other side. This movement will continue until all the charges will reach the surface of the conductor. So imagine that a table, the top of the table is the conductor, and the charge is introduced inside the table. Then this charge will create an electric field. The electric field will exert a force on the charges inside the material, which is the table. And these charges will begin to move because of the force that is exerted on them until they reach the surface of the material, so the surface of the table. So on the top of the table, let's say positive charges will reach there, and beneath the table, negative charges will reach there. And that is separation of charges. Now these charges will now again redistribute themselves in such a way that the charge inside the charge inside the conductor as well as the field inside the conductor will vanish. This is a very important point. <clears throat> because there's a separation of the charges, positive and negative, they also set up an electric field inside the material. And this new electric field will counter the original electric field that causes the separation of the charges. In this way, all charges will vanish from inside the conductor and all charges will be on the surface of the conductor. Similarly, inside the conductor, the electric field will be zero inside the conductor. Therefore, both charges and field inside the conductor will vanish. In summary, when you introduce a charge inside a conductor, that charge will create a field. That field will exert a force on the electrons and the neutrons, the positive and the negative charges inside the conductor. So the negative charges or the electrons will begin to drift away until they reach the surface of the conductor, such that inside the conductor will create another field which will count the original field that created the second field. And the counter means that the force are exerted on the charges and they're on the surface, so inside the conductor, there are no charges. And then inside the conductor also, the field inside will be zero. So that is the condition that is a condition of the conductor inside an electric field, which means, in summary, inside the conductor and the static condition, rho s is zero. What is rho s? Rho s is what? The charge density, the surface charge density. Inside the conductor, the charge density is zero. And inside the conductor also, the electric field intensity is zero. Consequently, the tangential component of the electric field on the surface of the conductor also vanishes. What does this mean? Because we say the charges are on the surface of the conductor, right? If the charges are on the surface, and then you have a field tangential to the surface, that is along the surface. This field will again exert a force on the charges and it will redistribute the charges in such a way that they will create another field again inside the conductor. But we have already said that inside the conductor, the field is zero. Therefore, if the field is zero inside the conductor, the tangential component on the surface must also be zero. Otherwise, it will create another field inside the conductor. So consequently, the tangential component of the electric field on the surface of the conductor also vanishes. If you have been paying attention, each one of this theory we discuss, I try to relate it to some very practical, useful example in everyday life. In the case of the field created by a static uh, charge, I have related it to the case of a, a cell phone site. What about in this case of a conductor inside an electric field. Now, some of you may have observed, especially in time past, that if you hold your cell phone and then you enter an elevator, which has a metallic wall, inside the elevator you see that 
his signal on your phone goes towards zero because the field inside the connector has what? Gone to zero, especially tangential to the surface of the conductor because most elevators are made up of conductors. And therefore, you usually will see that you do not have a signal because the field inside that conductor has gone to what? Zero. Therefore, under static conditions, the electric field on a conductor surface The electric field on a conductor surface is everywhere normal to the surface. What does that mean? We are saying that if you have a surface like this, tangential to the surface, the electric field is zero. Therefore, the only component of the electric field that can exist is the one that is what? Normal to the surface. That is at right angles to the surface. As for along the surface, the electric field is zero. So the E field on a conductor surface inside a static electric field is everywhere normal to the surface. In other words, the surface of a conductor is an equipotential surface under static condition. Equipotential surface means that the potential at any point on the conductor is the same. How is that the case? Because if you remember, what is the expression for the potential? The potential V is given by, let's say, A, B, E, D, L, where E is the electric field. Because on the surface of the conductor, at any point on the surface, the electric field is the same. That means that from A at point A, the electric field is the same as at point B. Therefore, if you perform this integral, A and B are the same, and this will be equal to what? Zero. So that the potential, <laughs> the surface of a conductor becomes an equipotential surface under static condition because the potential at all points on the surface are exactly the same. And so as a matter of fact, E, which is the electric field intensity is zero everywhere inside the conductor. The whole conductor therefore has the same electrostatic potential, which means that if you put a conductor inside an electric field, every point on the conductor has the same potential. Therefore the potential difference between any two points becomes equal to zero. Now we have something called boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions tell us what will happen between the boundaries of two different materials. So if you look at the diagram on the right, here we have a boundary that is formed between the conductor, there's a conductor here, and this one is also what? Free space. So you have a conductor and above the conductor is free space and there's a boundary between them. This here is the boundary here, the boundary between the two materials. So what will happen to the electric field on the surface of the conductor and inside the free space? What we'll realize is that because integral E D L is equal to zero. This is from our previous discussion. If you remember, we started with the fundamental postulate that curl of E equals zero. So curl of E equals zero. That was our fundamental postulate for um, for the curl of the electric field intensity. And then we went ahead to say that if you want the total field, you integrate. So we take the surface integral, the S of that, and that will also be equal to zero. And then we say that Stokes theorem allows us to convert 
this surface integral to a line integral such that integral C E D L is equal to what? Zero. So if integral E D L is equal to zero, if you look at a rectangle that is formed, part of the rectangle is in the conductor, the other part of the rectangle is in the free space. So this rectangle cuts between the two materials. In other words, you are looking at what happens exactly at the interface between the two materials. Now, if you are to add EDL around this, um, this rectangle, and then assume that this height here, delta H, is approximately equal to zero. What does delta H approximately equal to zero mean? It means that you're dealing with very close to the surface of the conductor and the free space, that is the interface. So you're looking at the right side or the width actually vanishing so that the top part here is almost merging with this part. And that gives you a condition at the interface. So at this interface, if you have to add EDL, then you have E and the length here is the W, right? So the tangential E times the W. So that is in this direction. And on the other hand, this direction will also be what? Minus E tangential times the W. Where am I subtracting? Because we are looking at them in two different directions. This one is in this direction, and this one is in this direction. And since ET is the same and the W is the same, ET the W minus ET the W must be equal to what? Zero. That means that at the interface of the material, talking about here, the interface, the electric field is again equal to zero or the tangential component of the field, ET is equal to zero. So in general, for conductors in static electric field, at the boundary of the conductor and free space, the tangential component of the E field, the tangential component of the E field on a conductor surface is zero under static condition. What about the normal component? As for the normal component, it's not zero. So what is the value of the normal component? We can get the value of the normal component from the divergence equation. If you remember the divergence postulates, it said that the divergence of E equals what? Rho S over epsilon naught. I hope you remember that. If you integrate this, then you're having integral divergence of E dV. It's a volume integral. It's equal to integral rho V over epsilon naught dV. And now we said that this volume integral can now be converted into a surface integral. And that surface integral then becomes integral E dS will be equal to integral rho V dV, if you remember, is Q. Or in this case, the surface charge is the rho S divided by what? Epsilon naught. So that means that the normal component, which in this case from this diagram, and this time we are looking at the peel box shape. Again, part of it in the conductor and then part of it in free space. And the electric field is En, which is the normal component. This dS is delta S here. So then you have E N delta S will be equal to what? Rho S over epsilon naught, also times what? This dS here will also be what? Delta S. So that delta S will cancel out, and then you simply have what? En equals rho s over 
epsilon naught. Therefore, in summary, in summary, at the boundary between a conductor and free space, the tangential component is zero, but the normal component is equal to what? Rho S divided by epsilon naught. So we say that the normal component, the normal component of the E-field at a conductor free space boundary is equal to the surface charge density on the conductor divided by the permittivity of free space. Well, the surface charge density is this, and this is the permittivity of free space. So in summary, again, the boundary conditions at the conductor, at the conductor free space interface is that the tangential component ET equals zero, and the normal component EN equals rho S over epsilon naught. And I think this is fairly easy to remember. Now we have an example here to illustrate what we discussed relative to what happens to a conductor inside an electric field. The example is very simple. You just need to pay attention and to follow. So it says that a positive point charge Q is at the center of a spherical conducting shell. So a positive point charge Q is at the center of a spherical conducting shell. So the spherical conducting shell, if you want to think about a football, which is a conductor, it's made up of metal. And a positive charge is placed in the center. And the inner radius of this shell from the center, let me redraw this again. So we have and then this is a shell. Now from the center to the inner radius of the shell, it is what? Inner radius R, actually it's Ri. And then outer radius to this point is what? R naught. Determine E and V as a function of the radial distance R. So what is the value of E as you move from the center along the radius to the inner uh, radius and then to the outer radius and then to the beyond the uh, conducting shell? That is what this question is about. If you remember our discussion of, uh, uh, what do you call it? Conductor inside an electric field. And now you remember that we put a positive charge inside this electric field. Remember what will happen? This positive charge will create a field inside the conductor, right? So we have a positive charge, and then this is the inner shell, and this is the outer shell. This positive charge will create a field. Now this field will exert a force on the electrons inside the conductor, inside the shell of the conductor. And the force that is exerted on the electrons will move these electrons to come to the surface of the conductor. They'll be at the surface of the conductor. So it means that when this happens, then inside the conductor, what happens to the electric field? The electric field goes to what? Zero. And the charges themselves go to what? also goes to zero. That is what this example is about to illustrate. So now let's look at the geometry. And because you have a charge inside a conducting shell, now that conducting shell, remember, it forms what we call previously what? 
What kind of surface? A Gaussian surface. Because it's Gaussian surface because the electric field at any point on the surface of the shell will be the same. It's a Gaussian surface. And because it is a Gaussian surface, it has a spherical symmetry. So it is simplest to use Gauss law to determine the electric field and then find the potential by integration. How do you find the potential from the electric field? V equals what? Integral EDL. So first we'll have to find the electric field at all the regions and then we find V from the electric field. So now this is the diagram. We have the positive charge here, okay? And this one, the uh, shaded region is the conducting shell. The inner radius here is Ri and the outer radius is R0. So we are now looking at three regions. What are those three regions? Inside here is region one, in this shell is region two, and then outside the shell is region three. So let's look at the first region. The first region is which one? Uh, inside the conducting shell, that is in this region. In that region, R is less than what? Ri, less than or equal to Ri. So that is up to this point. In class, one minute. Uh, not very important. Okay. 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 So, and now because we said that this charge is inside at the center and it will create an electric field radially in all directions, and therefore the intensity of the electric field at any point inside the radius here will be the same, right? And if we take a unit vector along the radius to be AR, then the electric field that will be created E will be given by what? AR times what? ER, where ER is the radial electric field. E will be equal to AR times ER. AR is what? the unit vector along the radius and ER is the radial electric field. What about um, so first let's look at no first we are looking at the case where R is greater than R naught. R greater than R naught is outside here outside Outside this, because the charges will move to the surface, and now you're seeing positive charges at the surface, and then negative charges inside here, because of the separation of the charges. So these are positive charges here on the surface of the conductor, and these are negative charges inside the conductor. So as far as the outside environment is concerned, it is experiencing the electric field due to the charge. And as we saw before, the electric field E that is E1, or in region 1, is given by what? Q over 4 pi epsilon naught R squared. And which one is this R? That is the radius outside of the sphere. So we are just using R for R naught. From here, R naught is outside of the sphere. And therefore, the again, the uh, electric field in that region R1 outside the sphere will be equal to Q divided by 4 pi epsilon naught R squared. Sorry, that's R squared. Outside the conductor. When we are dealing with inside the conductor here, then it is between Ri and R naught. And inside here, it is only relative to what? Ri.
And now how do you find V? The potential V as I indicated is found from integral E D what? E D L. This time the L will be given by what? The R because we're talking about along the radius. And again, remember that we said if you're finding the potential at a point, it must be relative to some point. In this case, when we're discussing the outside of the conductor shell, we can put the reference at what? Infinity. And therefore, we'll integrate from infinity, from R to infinity. And that is why we put this minus is to indicate that we are working against the field. And therefore, the um, potential is integral E R B R. So when you have one over R squared, is the same thing as r raised to the power minus two. If you integrate r raised to the power minus two, you get what? r raised to the power minus one. And then you multiply this by negative. So it becomes what? r raised to the power minus one, which is the same thing as what? One over r. Because everything else is a constant, the charge is not a function of r then four is constant, pi is constant, epsilon is constant. And therefore what you get is that V1 becomes equals what? Q over four pi epsilon naught R. As for the tangential field, we have already concluded that it's equal to zero. And therefore, what we are looking at uh, uh, R between R1 and R naught sorry, Ri between Ri and R0. So that is inside here, okay? Inside here between Ri and R0, what will happen to the field inside? The field inside will be zero, as we discussed previously. So along the, uh, the tangential field will be zero, and so the charges inside will also be what? Will be zero, as we discussed previously. And then as we discuss again, because of the force of the electric field exerted on the charges, you will have a negative charge equal to minus Q induced in the inner part, and that's why you have these negatives, these negatives here. And then a positive charge of plus Q induced at the outer parts of the shell. But inside, Inside the shell here, the electric field is zero, and the conductor, sorry, the charges inside there is also what? Zero. And then finally, the region, the region inside here, what will happen to the electric field? Again, the electric field is given by Q divided by four pi epsilon naught ri squared, ri squared. And then when we integrate, one of our ri squared becomes what? ri. In this case here, we add a constant of integration. And then the final answer for the integration is that um, there's going to be the potential difference between ri and then R naught. And therefore we have to have K given by Q over four pi epsilon naught. And instead of R, we have one over R naught minus one over R I here. So one over R naught minus one over R I. And this is a constant of integration. And when you add it to the previous answer, then you are going to have V equals Q over four pi epsilon naught ri, okay, then now plus this new constant. And therefore, when you put them all together, you have q over four pi epsilon naught being the same, and then one over r plus one over r naught minus one over ri. And that will be the potential inside this uh, uh, space, which is the third region. So this illustrates what happens to the conductor as it is in an in a static uh, electric field.
Now, so far we've been looking at dielectrics and static, we've been looking at conductors and static electric source. The other thing to look at is dielectric and static electric source. Now, we remember that for conductors, the electrons are free to move, right? But for dielectrics, the electrons are not free to move. Even then, the material is still composed of atoms. And these atoms, these atoms have what? Positive nucleus, positively charged nucleus and then negatively charged electrons. So it has both positive and negative charges, but they are bound to the material medium and they are not free to move. But when you have an external electric field, this external electric field will cause a force to be exerted on each charged particle. And it will result in small displacement of positive and negative charges in opposite direction. So in this case, the charges are not moving, but they are just merely displaced slightly in the opposite direction. This displacement will create what we call electric dipole, positive and negative dipoles. So if you look at this material here, because of the external electric field, the negative charge will experience the force in one direction and the positive charges will experience the force in the other direction. So if you look at the atoms, you can see that negative charges here, positive charges here. They are sort of displaced slightly on either direction. As a result of this displacement, eventually you see that one end of the material will have what? Negative charges. And another end of the material will have what? Positive charges. And therefore it behaves somewhat uh, a bit similar to the case of a conductor, even though the electrons are not free to move. But this displacement of the charges cause the material to become what? Polarized. It is made of two poles, negative pole, positive pole. So the material is what? Polarized. We talk about Ghana and we said our politics has polarized the country. Polarized the country, NDC being one pole and MPP being another pole. So the same thing when you have a material, uh, which is a dielectric, inside an electric field, the force exerted on the charges causes the material to be polarized. And the polarization of the material will create electric dipoles. And these electric dipoles will now modify the electric field both inside and outside the material. As you can see, some negative charges are at the edge here and some positive charges are at the edge here. This will set up electric field inside the material and then outside the material as well. And therefore, the electric field both inside and outside the material will all be what? Modified. Right. So then that gives us a certain classification. We have a certain classification called polar molecules. What are polar molecules? They are dielectric that possess permanent dipole moments. Their dipole is not temporary. It's not only when you have an electric field. They have permanent electric dipoles, even in the absence of external polarizing field. And this kind of polar molecules usually consist of what? Two or more dissimilar atoms. In other words, the molecules are made from atoms that are not the same. An example is water. So when you have water, Water, usually, what will happen is that if you look at the structure of water, so we are not only doing electromagnetic fields, we are also doing some chemistry. So this is the structure of water. Now, on this oxygen, oxygen has two electrons in the outermost shell. It is more electronegative 
and it will tend to pull the electrons, even though it shares electrons. It's a covalent bond. Covalent bond. Even though these are covalent bonds, they're supposed to share the electrons. Because the oxygen is more electronegative, it will pull the electrons more towards itself, making it negative slightly, and therefore the hydrogen becoming what? Slightly positive. This also becoming slightly positive. And this negative and positive forms a permanent what? Dipole. Moment. So molecules like water, they have what? Permanent dipole moments, even in the absence of an external electric field. And this is the case because the atoms do not lie diametrically opposite the other. If water has a structure like this, H O H, this situation will not have a reason. But because of this kind of arrangement for water, it gives rise to this situation that we have just described. Now we say that the dipole moments of polar molecules are very small, of the order of 10 to the power minus 30 Coulomb's meter. When there is no electric field or external field, the individual dipoles in the polar uh, dielectric are randomly oriented. That is, in the absence of an external field, they are oriented in different directions. So you have some in this direction, some in this direction, in different directions. The dipole moments are oriented randomly in different directions. And therefore, there is no net dipole moment. Because they are in different directions, you don't have a net dipole moment, right? But if you apply an external electric field, then they will all align in one direction like this. And the alignment in one direction will create a resultant electric dipole moment. So create a resultant electric dipole moment. Now we are going to look at the nature of this electric dipole moment. Before we look at that, let's talk about a certain vector called the polarization vector P. P is simply equal to the uh, volume charge density of the dipole moment. So PK here being the dipole moment divided by the volume, just like we have uh, Rho V, the volume charge density given by Q divided by the volume. So the same thing, you have the polarization vector, which is given by the sum of the dipole moments divided by the volume in which they are found. Now the numerator represents the sum of the induced dipole moments contained in a very small volume, the V. Let's go back to the uh, structure of the uh, dielectric material. So you look at this material, and there are dipole moments all over the material. If these dipole moments are aligned because of the external electric field, if you take a small volume and you add all the dipole moments, it gives you what is in the numerator here. So this numerator here, is the sum of all the dipole moment within a small volume dV. And therefore the dipole moments of an elemental volume dV dipole moment which is the P of an elemental volume, the V prime, must be given by P, the V prime. Why? Because P equals what? The sum of the P divided by what? The V, as we saw in the previous uh, slide. And therefore, the P here must be equal to the P times what? 
dv, where p here is the polarizing vector. Now the polarizing vector will produce an electrostatic potential given by p, which is the volume charge density of the volume charge density of the electric dipole. Think about rho v, which is the volume charge density. If you want to look at the uh, electrostatic potential relative to uh, rho v, then it's dv equals rho v divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r. Please, this is a mistake. Not r squared. It should be r. So the same way, if you replace this rho v by p, which is the polarization vector, then you have p, which is in the direction ar. Ar here is a unit vector. So you have p divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r, which is the uh, electrostatic potential. If you want the total electrostatic potential, then v equals 1 over epsilon naught integral. Okay, this is before integration. Before integration, sorry, it is a squared, and after integration, it becomes the square becomes what one. Now this equation is not different from the previous equation that we saw in the last lecture. We said v for a volume charge density is one over four pi epsilon naught. Then uh, integral v one over what r squared dv. You can see that it's the same equation. Sorry, rho v here. Rho v over r squared. So now just rho v is being replaced by what? P dot ar, which is the polarizing vector. Now, one last term, and we'll be out of here, is the equivalent polarization surface charge density. And that surface charge density is given by the normal components. Sorry. The normal component of the polarization vector, which is P, A, N. Remember that we said on the surface, the tangential components are zero. Only the normal components do exist. And that polarization surface charge density, rho P, S, is given by this. And let's look at what, what that will do to the relation. Before we get there, there is also the polarization volume charge density. First, we look at the surface charge density, rho ps. But then the next one is the polarization volume charge density, which is rho pv. And then rho pv is rather given by the divergence or negative divergence of the polarization vector. So rho pv was negative divergence of the polarization vector. And this will give us a relation that is probably familiar to uh, most people. Now the total charge then is this. We have a charge due to the surface. Let me go back to the diagram so that we can understand this uh, in context. We have two uh, charges here. We have the charges that are on the surface. These charges on the surface, on the either side of the material, they give us the rho ps, that's this one. And then we still have this dipole moment inside, and they will give us the rho pv. So we have rho ps and rho pv. So that the sum the total charge will be given by that due to the rho ps and that due to the rho pv. When you add them, you get the total charge. And remember that we said rho ps is the normal component of the polarization vector, and rho pv is the divergence of the polarization vector. If you do this, then we can have the potential again 
by integrating as we have done before. So this is the potential due to the surface charge density, rho PS, and this is the potential due to the volume charge density, rho PV. Now, this is only consistent with the uh, discussion that we have had previously, but not that we are going to use this for any particular uh, calculation. Just to give an understanding that there's a consistency in determining the uh, potential due to any given charge. Now, because of the polarized dielectric, it gives rise to an equivalent volume charge density. This equivalent volume charge density is rho V, rho PV, as we saw before. And then we can say that previously, our equation was that the divergence of E equals what? Rho V over epsilon naught. But now we have additional uh, volume charge density. So we say that the divergence of E will be equal to 1 over epsilon naught into bracket rho, rho V plus rho PV. And then we can so let me write it here. Divergence of E equals one over epsilon naught rho V plus rho P V. Now we know that by multiplying epsilon naught with this, we have epsilon naught divergence of E will be equal to rho V plus rho PV. And we know that rho PV is given by the negative divergence of P, as we saw in the previous slide. So if you substitute that by this, we can actually bring this to the other side. So then we have epsilon naught divergence of E plus divergence of P will be equal to rho V here. And since divergence is common to this, we can pull the divergence out and then we have divergence into brackets, epsilon naught times E plus P equals rho V. And now we can define another vector to represent epsilon naught plus P, which is what we see in the next slide. So we are defining D, which is the electric flux density to be equal to the epsilon naught E plus P. And if we replace that, so epsilon naught E plus P will become D, therefore we have divergence of D equals rho V. So then we have divergence of D equals rho V. And if divergence of D equals rho V, then we have integral divergence of D, dV must be equal to what? Integral rho V dV. And we know that we can change the volume integral to a surface integral, as we saw before. So we have integral S, D, dS, and rho V dV will give you Q if you integrate that, because rho V is actually the Q over dV. So that the Q will be equal to rho V dV. And if we integrate both sides, you have Q equals integral rho V dV. So that integral S D D S will be equal to what? Q. And this is another expression of what? The Gauss law. Gauss law. So what you need to remember after all of this is that the surface integral of the electric flux density or electric di displacement is equal to what? Q.
Thus, another form of Gauss law states that the total outward flux of the electric displacement over any closed surface is equal to the total free charge enclosed in the surface. So this is simply saying <clears throat> that if you have a charge, how much the flux will go out or diverge will be equal to what? The charge within the volume, which makes sense. You have more charge, you have more divergence. You have less charge, you have less divergence. Now, we have another expression here that helps us simplify things further. When the dielectric properties of the medium are linear and isotropic, uniform, then the polarization is directly proportional to the dielectric, sorry, to the electric field intensity. So that is P, which is a polarization vector, is directly proportional to E. The constant of proportionality then becomes epsilon naught chi E. This chi E is called the electric susceptibility, electric susceptibility. So we have another relationship that P, the polarization vector equals epsilon naught chi E times E. And remember, we had this expression where we said D equals what? Epsilon naught E plus P. So this P can be replaced by epsilon naught plus chi E times E, and then we have D equals epsilon naught E plus epsilon naught chi E times E. Now epsilon naught and E are common, so we can actually factor them out, and then that becomes D equals epsilon naught into brackets, 1 plus chi E times E. And this factor here, 1 plus chi E, is another factor we call the relative permittivity. Epsilon R is given by 1 plus chi E. And if you replace epsilon R with 1 plus chi E, then what you get is that eventually D becomes equal to what? Epsilon naught epsilon r times what? E. And epsilon naught times epsilon r also is actually the permittivity of the material called epsilon. So that simply D becomes equals epsilon E. So for a material medium, not free space, the electric flux density D equals epsilon E. In the previous discussion, we said the constitutive relations is that D equals epsilon naught what? times E, because we're dealing with free space. But when it is not free space, D must be equal to what? Epsilon, which is the permittivity of the material, times E. And what is epsilon? Epsilon equals epsilon naught times epsilon R. And what is epsilon R? Epsilon R is given by what? One plus chi E, as we indicated in this previous discussion. So that is in brief. Uh, what the situation of a dielectric is in a particular electric medium. All that we have said boils down to the fact that when you have a dielectric in a, uh, in a material medium, the dielectric becomes what? It becomes polarized. And when it becomes polarized, you have displacement of negative charges and positive charges. And as a result of this displacement of charges, as a result of displacement of charges, you have another volume charge density that is created as a result of the polarization vector. And that is what will lead us to a quantity which is called the electric displacement as a result of the displacement of the charges, which is given by epsilon times E, where E is the electric field that is causing the displacement of the charges. And epsilon is the permittivity of the material. So this is what I was discussing earlier. 
where we said epsilon equals epsilon not than epsilon r, or epsilon r is epsilon divided by what? Epsilon not. This should be epsilon not, not epsilon r. Which is the relative permittivity of the material. So the permittivity of the material relative to free space is the relative permittivity of the material. So I just uh, <clears throat> some brief background about dielectric strength, and then we finish with boundary conditions. So if the electric field causing the polarization is dielectric, sorry, if the electric field causing polarization in the dielectric material is very strong, it will pull electrons completely out of the molecules. So let's go back to the um, material again. So this external electric field, this external electric field is causing the displacement of the uh, charges. But if the field is very strong, extremely strong, then it will actually pull the electrons from their mother atom. It will pull them out. It will yank them out of the mother atom. And for that to happen, we say the material must reach what? Electric breakdown. So then we can talk about the breakdown voltage, the voltage that is necessary to cause a breakdown of the material. Now, how much a material can withstand breakdown is the dielectric strength of the material. How much a material can stand breakdown is the dielectric strength of the material. So let's go there. So if the If the dielectric field causing polarization in a dielectric material is very strong, it will pull electrons completely out of the molecules, as we indicated. The electrons will accelerate under the influence of the electric field, and then they will collide violently with the molecule lattice structure. So as they move, they collide with the molecule, and then they will cause permanent dislocation and damage in the material. This is called avalanche effects of ionization which is due to the collision. And this collision may generate even more electrons in that respect. And the material will not become what? Conducting. Because previously the material was not conducting because it didn't have free electrons. But as a result of a very high voltage and a high electric field, electrons are young from the mother atom and they are free to move and they collide with the mother atom generating more charges due to ionization. Then the material becomes conducting and a large current may result. This phenomenon is called dielectric breakdown. And as I indicated, the ability of the material to withstand the breakdown is called its dielectric strength. So the maximum dielectric field, also the maximum electric field intensity that a dielectric material can withstand without breakdown is called the dielectric strength of the material. The dielectric strength of air at the atmospheric pressure is given as three kilovolts per millimeter. And if you look at it in terms of kilovolts per meter, this would be three megavolts per meter. And that's a very high electric field. So at this electric field, then air breaks down. When the electric field exceeds this value, air breaks down and the massive ionization will take place. And then you have what we call the uh, corona discharge, which in the beginning of the lessons uh, we mentioned, if you remember. So the corona discharge is what gives like a glow, a glow in the atmosphere as a result of light being refracted at different wavelengths due to the ionization that has taken place. 
Now, this is the last aspect of this uh, discussion. We are going to look at the boundary conditions. First, we look at the boundary conditions uh, at the interface of a conductor. Now we have to do the same thing at the interface of what? A dielectric. Or general boundary conditions for electrostatic flows between two general media. So medium one and medium two, these are two general media. Now, because the uh, tangential component from integral EDL equals zero, then E1 tangential plus E2 tangential must be equal to zero. And since they are opposite, as we indicated previously, then E1 tangential must be equal to E2 tangential because this will be E1 tangential dW equals E2 tangential dW. So the W cancels out, and then E1 tangential will be equal to what? E2 tangential. Now remember, we are not talking about the boundary between a conductor. For a boundary between the conductor, the tangential component is equal to what? Zero. But this is general media, general media. We are in a specific case of conductor and then dielectric. So if E1 equals E2 tangential, remember, D equals what? Epsilon E. Therefore, E must be equal to what? D divided by what? Epsilon. So E1 tangential will be D1 tangential divided by Epsilon 1, and E2 tangential will be D2 tangential divided by Epsilon 2. Now, the fact that E1 tangential equals E2 tangential means that the tangential component of an electric field is continuous across an interface because E1 here <laughs> is the same thing as E2 here. So it means the field is continuous across the interface. When they are not the same, then we say they are discontinuous. They are discontinuous. And then from um, the electric flux density, which we said integral d ds equal what? Integral d ds will be equal to what? Rho s, because we are considering the surface charge on the surface. Originally, it was uh, integral or simply ds or d, the normal component, d equals what? Rho s divided by epsilon naught. Sorry, that's E. If it is E, the normal component of E equals rho s divided by what? Epsilon naught. But as for, because D equals epsilon naught E, then if you multiply epsilon naught by E here, you have epsilon naught E, N must be equal to what? Rho s and this epsilon naught is what d, which is equal to what rho s, and that is why you have integral d ds must be equal to what rho s ds. We don't have epsilon naught again in the equation. Now, if you want integral d ds, you must add the normal component in medium one and medium two. The normal component in medium one is d1 a n2. So in medium one here. You have D1 times A N2 because it's in the direction of A N2. And then in medium two here will be D2 times A N1. But because they are in opposite direction, they are going to subtract. And because, of course, these are unit vectors, A N2 is the same thing as what? A N2 is the same thing as A N1. So we can just use one A N2 and then the negative value here equals rho S the S. And obviously, the S here can cancel out so that A N2 into bracket D1 minus D2 must be equal to what? Rho S. So what it means is that the normal components in medium 1, D1 N, minus the normal component in medium 2, D2 N, is equal to what? Rho S. So in the case of the normal component across the interface, and the amount of discontinuity is equal to rho s.
So that's this, as uh, I indicated earlier. It says that the normal component of D field is discontinuous, it's not continuous, across an interface where a surface charge exists. The amount of discontinuity being equal to the surface charge density rho s. However, if rho s is equal to zero, then of course D1n must be equal to D2n, since rho s is zero. And since D1 is epsilon 1, E1n, and D2 is what? Epsilon 2, sorry. D1 is what? Epsilon 1, oh. Epsilon 1, E1n, we call it D2 is what? Epsilon 2, D2n. And therefore, we have this relationship for the boundary conditions. So if the surface charge is zero, then the electric flux density is also continuous across the interface. Boundary condition, in summary, for a general material uh, medium, E1 tangential equals E2 tangential is continuous. And the normal component, the difference equals rho s. Now we look at capacitor, and that brings us to the end of the discussion. So capacitances, sorry. Capacitances and capacitors. I mentioned to you earlier that electromagnetic force theory is actually um, a simplification, sorry, circuit theory is actually a simplification of electromagnetic force theory. You know the capacitance, the charge, and the voltage are related by Q equals what? CV. How did that come about? Because if you remember, En, as we discussed previously, equals what? Rho S over epsilon naught. This rho S is surface charge density. And then since we can get V from E, integral E dl, so V is voltage or potential. If you increase V by a factor of K, you also increase E by a factor of K. And therefore, you increase Q by a factor of K. In other words, there's a direct proportionality between V and Q. So that the constant of proportionality being C gives us Q equals what? CV. And this C is called the capacitance of a capacitor. So Q equals CV. In other words, the ratio Q over V also always remains constant since uh, Q, so Q over V is also always equal to what C. Whatever the corresponding V, it will correspond to Q and the ratio will always be equal to what? The capacitance. So C is a constant of proportionality and it's called the capacitance of a capacitor. So how do you determine the capacitance of a capacitor? First, we choose an appropriate coordinate system. Let's say you choose the Cartesian coordinate system, Cartesian coordinate system. You assume charges plus Q and minus Q on the conductors. So two conductors, this is plus Q, and the other conductor minus Q, right? Then we find E from Q using Gauss law or other relations. What is the Gauss law? Integral E dS equals what? Integral rho s, sorry, d dS equals integral rho s dS. So if you find d, you can find e, which is epsilon, sorry. If you know d, if you find d by this, then you can find e, which will be what? d divided by what? Epsilon. And if you find e, then you can find v from what? v equals integral. EDL. So first, choose an appropriate coordinate system. Assume plus Q and minus Q on the conductors. Find E from Q using Gauss law or other relations. Then find V by evaluating integral DL. And then from the conductor carrying Q to the conductor carrying L, uh, carrying plus Q. 
So these two conductors, they have a distance, right? And that will be the L. This distance here will be what? The L. So now that you have found V, and then we have assumed Q, then we can find C, which is given by what? Q divided by V. And that's how you find the capacitance of a capacitor. So that was uh, the end of the lecture. And we have looked at what happens to conductors in electric field, what happens to Thank you.